Thank you very much for coming and good morning to you. On behalf of the Tasmanian Planning Information Network, I welcome you. Before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge with deep respect the Moanina people who are the traditional owners of Nipaluna Hobart, which is the land we're meeting on. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and to the Aboriginal community that continues to care for country. Heritage is that which has been preserved for us, and that which we wish to preserve for future generations. Tasbin recognises three major areas of heritage that are important to Nicoluna Hobart. The natural land and environmental landscape heritage has preceded human habitation that is so valuable in defining the character of our city and contributing to our well-being. The Moanina people have cared for and protected country for thousands of years. Their preservation of natural heritage through cultural practices is becoming recognised, particularly in the area of fire management. True respect and acknowledgement of them must preserve their heritage as integral to the human story of Nipaluna and all of La Tuita. Today's discussion involves the European built heritage. In the traditional view, heritage values are always implicitly of the past and any change to a designated place can only diminish its established aesthetic, historic and social qualities. In the emerging view, the value of heritage lies in its capacity to promote the sustainability and continuity of places and their evolving values. The law can direct change and development guided by public participation, design interventions and cultural values so that heritage policy and process can amplify the significance of places. We hope to understand what heritage people value in Hobart, what is protected by legislation, and what should be protected by legislation. Our group formed after we became aware of the major changes called the state planning legislation, which doesn't do much planning, but gives an awful lot of freedom to developers. And so we feel it's important that the community feed back to the government what we value and what is important. To that end, I would like to welcome Brendan Leonard, who very kindly has agreed to introduce us to the Hope Art Heritage that he has been integral in protecting over the last 25 years. Thank you, Margaret, and good morning, everyone. Um, nice to see so many. Friends, old friends, and uh, people that I've uh, worked with over the years. Um, I'm, I retired from the council about um, 18 months ago, March last year. In fact, the day after I left the council, the council closed the doors to the public and everyone was working from home, so it seemed like everyone else had retired. It was a funny time to retire. So I'm going to talk briefly about um, the protection of uh, built cultural heritage, historic cultural heritage, European cultural heritage. I've always known the job that I do as cultural heritage, but it's been differentiated over the years, and it's now, certainly in the planning legislation, it's called Historic Cultural Heritage, and we've got the Historic Cultural Heritage Act, and that's deliberately to differentiate it from Aboriginal cultural heritage. So first of all, we'll just talk about some definitions. So. Cultural heritage means all those aspects of human activity and endeavour which have shaped the present and which are inherited by the present community. Cultural heritage may include specific places, but it also includes activities, institutions, customs and concepts. In respect of these places, cultural significance means aesthetic, historic, scientific, social, spiritual value for past, present, or future generations. I think the thing about the sort of intergenerational aspect of heritage is a really important thing. So heritage isn't just what we value, it's what future generations may value, or what generations in the past may have valued. It's not just our core, I guess. We, we're 
acting in, on behalf of the people that have come before us, and we're acting on behalf of a community um, that's not even born yet. Now in Tasmania, the legislative framework um, involving cultural heritage it basically sits under three different acts. The three acts were all conceived as part of a um, reform back in the early 90s. In fact, the 1993, both the Local Government Act and the Land Use Plan and Approvals Act 93. The Heritage Act was conceived basically at the same time, but it wasn't enacted until 1995. So the Local Government Act, um, all councils, all 29 councils in Tasmania, operate under the Local Government Act. Section 20 of the Act sets out the functions and the powers of a council. And key functions of the local government agency, so the Hobart City Council, Brighton Council, Clarence, etc., key functions include the formulation and implementation of policies, the facilitation of proper planning and development in the best interests of the community, and efficient and effective management of resources. So that's basically saying planning isn't just something that happens by the state government, it actually is a key thing that councils do, is planning for the best interests of the community. That's one of the key things that the council does. Yes, it does all the other things like, you know, look after the roads, picks up the rubbish, etc., etc., um, looks after the parks, but it's actually the facilitation of proper planning and development in the best interests of the community is a basic fundamental thing in the Local Government Act. The Act also sets out requirements for councils to have strategic plans, operational plans and annual reports. I know you know, when I work with a council we're always sort of, you know, we, we know sooner to seem to sign off on one strategic plan we start to sort of planning for the review or the next one. And it's probably the same with most organisations. Strategic plans need to be um, prepared I think every five or ten years. Um, it's an ongoing process to make sure that things are up to date. And another aspect of the Local Government Act, and I think this is also important, is that Section 65 of the Act requires that any advice or recommendation given to the Council, it's given by a person who has the qualification or the experience necessary to give such advice. So when councils are considering matters on anything, whether it's cultural heritage or whether it's on public art or whether it's on um, you know, new roads or something, it has to receive the advice and recommendations by people who are qualified to give that advice. They can't just rely on information that, you know, or someone has sort of thought it's a good idea, someone um, has a, a, um, a particular thing that they want to lobby about, the, the councils actually have to act on recommendations and advice given by qualified experts. And you'll notice when the council, I think in the, um, each of the agenda papers, there's a thing at the front of the, of the uh, agenda where the general manager of the council, the executive officer, basically signs off saying, I, I agree, or I, I certify that the information uh, given in these agenda papers has been prepared in accordance with section, section 65 of the Act. That's an interesting thing to me because when you think of cultural heritage, um, how many heritage officers are there in Tasmania working in local government? Hobart certainly has a team of heritage officers. Um, Glenorchy has a heritage officer. Um, there aren't many other councils that actually have dedicated heritage officers. Yes, they might have planners um, with an interest in cultural heritage. I know Southern Midlands has a heritage officer, but you know, some of the smaller councils don't have heritage officers. So where do they get their people with qualifications and experience necessary to provide advice to council on cultural heritage? Now, the answer to that is they probably outsource it to um, heritage consultants. Um, I don't know. In some other states, um, they have a network um, of heritage consultants. They have regional heritage advisors who might, so one person 
might actually be the heritage of Faisal for a number of different shires around New South Wales or councils in Victoria. Um, but in Tasmania, we don't quite have that system, I think. And I, it worries me a little bit in terms of some of the smaller councils about how um, they actually deal with that requirement to provide advice in terms of cultural heritage. Um, as I said, the councils have to refer a strategic plan. This is our current strategic plan in Hobart. The capital city strategic plan 2019 to 2029. It's interesting because a lot of the strategic plan, this current strategic plan, is based on the city vision exercise which was done a few years ago, which was a, I mean, some of you may have been involved in that with all the workshops up in the town hall. Um, that was a really inter interesting and engaging sort of exercise in terms of finding out from the Hobart community, the public, the visitors, the residents, um, what they thought about Hobart where they want to have out to be in the future. Um, so this, yeah, the city vision document um, is a really important document and it underpins the council's strategic plan. If you look through the strategic plan, for example, pillar seven um, is to do with the built environment. And it makes this statement, Hobart's built environment is well loved by local communities for its human scale, its parks and reserves, and walkability, heritage buildings and the character character of its neighbourhoods and streetscapes. So this is something that is recognised in the strategic plan. So you know, when council, when the alderman and the council is making decisions about heritage places, heritage streetscapes, um, you know, planning decisions generally, they, they need to have this in mind because this is the strategic plan that the council itself has signed off on and it's come, it's been born from um, the community's input, community's desire. Julian Gallagher in the strategic plan um, underneath that 7.2, the outcome is development enhances Hobart's unique identity, human scale and built heritage. This is an outcome that the council wants to achieve. It's on the record in the 2019 to 2029 strategic plan the council wants to achieve development that enhances Hobart's unique identity, human scale and built heritage. And how's it going to do that? It's going to promote contemporary heritage conservation practices, support adaptive reuse of heritage assets. Um, it's going to collaborate with stakeholders, including the Tasmanian Heritage Council, for the best possible care of heritage sites and streetscapes. Um, it's going to advocate for iconic buildings and spaces to remain open to public access, etc., etc. These are all things in our strategic plan. The next bit of legislation, so we dealt with the Local Government Act and the strategic plan. The next legislation is LUPA, the Land Use Planning and Approvals Act. It establishes the Land Use Planning and Approvals provisions within the overall resource management and planning system in Tasmania. Now, Schedule 1 of the Act, Part 2, it sets out the objectives of the planning process. One of the objectives for which the planning process um, was established, and one of the objectives, and my favourite objective, um, is Objective G. And that is to conserve those buildings, areas or other places which are of scientific, aesthetic, architectural or historical interest or otherwise of special cultural value. So one of the fundamental objectives of the planning system in Tasmania is to conserve cultural heritage. That's, a, that, you know, that's one of the <coughs> fundamental reasons why we have a planning system, is to conserve places of interest. And there was a well-known um, court case about 15, 20 years ago, where the council actually refused a development application for the demolition of a building um, that wasn't listed. And they refused it on the basis that it was a building of interest. It wasn't listed in the planning scheme, it wasn't listed as a, as a registered building, it wasn't listed by the National Trust or anything. But it had been identified for future listing in an industrial heritage study. And anyway, the council said, well, 
we have to refuse this application for that building to be demolished because part of our um, and then there was a discretion, the council had a discretion to approve or refuse the development. So the discretion existed, which was an important thing. But in the exercise of this discretion, it said part of when we make a decision, we have to look at the objectives of the Act. And one of the objectives is to preserve heritage. So that went to the tribunal. Um, the, uh, like the council refused application, went to the tribunal. The tribunal upheld the council decision. The developer, um, not satisfied with that, took, actually took it to the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court um, upheld the tribunal decision and said yes, the council, uh, the tribunal and the council were quite right to reject the application. Not happy with that, the developer actually appealed to the full court, the, the Supreme Court, so the three judges, and they basically reinforced the decision. Um, so that, that was quite a celebrated decision because it meant that it's not just what's listed in the planning scheme that's important, it's actually um, this provision, one of the objectives is fundamental. And it's ironic that the Planning Appeal Tribunal is now in that same complex which was preserved in Barrack Street, 38 Barrack Street, the old blacksmith shop. The tribunal is in the back in the new building at the back, but the building at the front, um, which, is this, which is what is going to be the modest, is actually still there. Now, part three of the Act deals with preparation review of state planning provisions, which you all know about. Part 3A deals with local provision schedules. Section 35N requires the council to keep its local provision schedules under regular and periodic review. So every five years, councils have to check the local provisions in the planning scheme um, to check that they're um, meeting the objectives of work. It basically means that councils can't just do have a, a set of planning provisions and a list of buildings and places and say, look, well, that's fine, we've got that list, we did it 20 years ago, we don't have to add to it. They're actually, every five years, they actually have to review and make sure that it's consistent and it's actually meeting the objectives. And this gives the council an opportunity to say, well, look, are there gaps in what's um, protected? Are there gaps in what the council are doing? Um, we, we think we need to reinforce or strengthen our local provisions. Part four of the Act deals with planning control. This is the thing that happens every report, right, every the meetings of the, the committee and the full council. Part four deals with planning control or development proposal. And section 512 says that in determining an application for a permit, so when the council is making a decision, it must seek to further the objectives of the Act. So every time the council and the aldermen, um, the elected members, every time they make a decision in determining an application for a permit, they have to have this in the back of their mind. Are we conserving buildings, areas or places which are of interest? Um, or otherwise a special cultural revenue. That's a requirement of LUPA. The other legislation I want to touch on is the Historic Cultural Heritage Act. Tasmania was one of the last states to actually have a Heritage Act. Um, the original, well, the first act, I think, might have been in Victoria or New South Wales back in the 1970s, and I worked with the National Trust in Sydney. Um, <coughs> the heritage legislation came in. That goes back to nearly 20 years, or more than 20 years before our Act here. The Act was, is dated 1995, but it was actually proclaimed in early 1997, and it actually didn't start effectively until then. Um, it established the Tasmanian Heritage Council and, and the Tasmanian Heritage Register. The Heritage Act sets out criteria for including a place on the register. A place can be a site or a building, etc. It can be items historically or physically associated with the building, which is an interesting thing. It's not just buildings, but it can be you know, the surrounding things. It can be um, you know, the landscape, or it can be a cemetery, for example. Um, in fact, it can, can be historical records, can be documents that are associated with the place as well, can be protected under the Heritage Act. I don't think there are any, but um, they, they could, for example, say um, that the listing of a place actually includes the, the minute books or the records or the registers or whatever associated with that place. When the 
register was initially set up, well, to set this register up, we're going to basically take the National Trust Register and we're going to take the registers from Hobart and Launceston. And that's going to be the basis of the, of the Tasmania Heritage Register. And that's really what they did. Um, and what they subsequently did, they then filtered throughout, they, they filtered their register and said, look, we don't need all these buildings, we actually, all of these buildings aren't of state heritage significance, so we're actually going to take them off the register. And but they only took them off the register if they were already protected in a local planning scheme. So I know in Hobart, for example, the, T the Tasmanian Heritage Council took off, you know, I mean, I don't know, there's hundreds of buildings off the Tasmanian Heritage Register. And everyone said, oh, well, a lot of them said, that's terrible. Why are they coming off the Heritage Register? And some people were happy, saying, oh, our place isn't heritage listed anymore. But the Heritage Council only took them off the register if they were already adequately protected um, in the Hobart Planning Centre. So I had a discussion with so many people. Oh, I got a letter from the Heritage Council saying our building's not registered anymore. So, well, it is because it's actually listed in the Hobart Planning Centre. New places identified and added on a regular basis. Um, the Heritage Council does, and every so often you see in the paper, new places being added. Um, there's a process where they provisionally um, include things and they invite comment and then they permanently register places. In the Heritage Act, it says local government authorities have a responsibility to coordinate the approval provisions under the Act. So if you're applying for um, approval under the Heritage Act, you actually do it by going to the council. If your building's on the Tasmanian Heritage Register, you actually you don't go to the Tasmanian Heritage Council and seek permission, you actually go over the road to the local council, and the local council um, gets the Heritage Council's approval as part of the planning process. Dealing with planning schemes, now, <clears throat> up until five or six years ago, in Hobart, we had three planning schemes. We had the Battery Point Planning Scheme, the City of Hobart Planning Scheme, Sullivan's Cove Planning Scheme. And each of those planning schemes had schedules dealing with cultural heritage. Battery Point was Schedule E, Hobart was Schedule F, and the Sullivan's Cove was Schedule 1. Yeah, we've got 29 councils in Hobart and over 30 planning schemes. And so, as we all know, you know, there was a push to say, well, this is silly having so many planning schemes in Tasmania. It's, it's so hard for people to sort of make sense of all this. We need to have a single planning scheme. So that's what's happened. Um, we have gradually moved away from having all these different planning schemes to having one planning scheme for the state. But the one planning scheme for the state actually has at least, or will have at least, 30 local provision schedules. So while it might seem like there's one planning scheme, I'm actually, I'm not sure that we've actually <laughs> moved very far at all because each different council will have different local provision schedules. It's not a lot different to the idea of having a number of planning schemes all fitting within the same template. The Hobart interim planning scheme, which is what we have in Hobart at the moment, and I say it's at the moment because it's all, it will all move to the state planning scheme. So at the moment in the Hobart interim planning scheme, we've got this historic heritage code, and um, it's split up the purpose application of the code, um, it defines terms. Importantly, it talks about development that is exempt from this code, and then 13.5 talks about application requirements, so the council can, if someone submits an application, the council thinks, oh, we need to have more information on this, when, like, for example, we need to have a conservation plan, we need to have some photographs of the existing building, we need to have um, further information. 13.5 lets council legitimately seek further information from the, the applicant. And the, the, the application won't be advertised until those application requirements are met. Sometimes um, the, count, the, the proponent or the applicant might think, oh, this is an onerous uh, expectation that council has asked me to provide all this additional information. They can actually appeal that um, request. And I mean, a, a, a recent example of that is what happened with the cable car. The, 
um, the cable, the, the Harbour City Council sought further information, sought a further number of reports on the cable car proposal, um, one including Aboriginal cultural heritage. The proponent said, oh, this is unreasonable. They actually appealed that in the tribunal, and the tribunal said, no, we do have to do that. With it. So that's an example of um, further information requirements. Use standards, there are no use standards in the, for heritage under the plan scheme. In other words, if you want to change the use of a building without any physical change, if you just simply want to change the use of this building, of a building, um, you do not need to comply. There are no, there's nothing in the heritage code where you need to comply with because all you're doing is changing the use. You're not actually physically changing the building at all. So use is, is basically doesn't apply um, in, in terms of cultural heritage. Then the critical thing is 13.7 of the development standards for heritage places, and that sets out you know, the various assessment criteria for individual places. 13.8 deals with precincts. 13.9 is landscape precincts, and we've got a number of landscape precincts, including fern tree, um, Queen's Domain and I think there's Lena Valley as well. And then finally 13.10 is development standards for places with archaeological potential. Then following um, that part of the scheme, there are four tables. One is a table of all the heritage places, heritage precincts, cultural landscape precincts and places of archaeological potential. Table 3.1 is basically the what would have been known as the old heritage register. It's a list of places, um, probably about 2,000 or so now, um, maybe more um, of individual places that are uh, identified in Hobart as having some sort of significance. And so on all those places, people um, have to submit a planning application, and when it's assessed, it has to be assessed against 13.7. Heritage precincts, like heritage areas, basically, in the, old, in the original planning scheme, I think there are only about um, 13 heritage areas. There's now over 40 precincts, um, and they are basically um, collections of buildings, sometimes streets, sometimes virtually whole suburbs, where there is a sort of a generally homogenous character. Um, and so, again, if you're developing a a building uh, could even be a vacant site within a heritage precinct. You have to um, submit the application and it is assessed under the schedule and it's assessed against the development standards. Now, we've moved from what we are moving away from the Hobart Interim Planning Scheme to this new Tasmanian Planning Scheme. So the, this, the government amended LUPA. 2015 to introduce a single statewide planning scheme. I can remember everyone saying, oh, this is this is so good, just having one planning scheme. And, and instead of people having to fight their way through 30 individual documents, we're just going to have one um, scheme. It's going to be so much easier for everyone, for, you know, whether you're a developer or whether you're a resident, it's going to be so much easier to find your way through the Tasmanian planning system because we're just going to have a single planning scheme. Politicians time and time again were saying how powerful this is going to be. But in detail, the Tasmanian planning scheme is made up of two parts. It's made up of the state planning provisions and it's made up of the local provision schedules. And when you add all those things up, particularly the local provision schedules, you end up with a... I mean, if you actually printed it all out, if you... If you did, and not many people would, but if you actually printed it all out, um, I'm sure it would add up to a lot more paper than all the existing planning schemes. It'd be an interesting exercise if we had some, um, I mean, I don't know who, well, sometimes lawyers like printing stuff out because they like to actually see it. Um, it would be an interesting exercise. <laughs> This all comes off the, um, the website. The state planning scheme is made up of two parts, state and local. So that's the planning scheme. It has state planning provisions and local provisions scheduled for each council. The state planning provisions set out what's exempt, define things, give you the general provisions, give you the zone provisions, because there are different provisions depending whether you're in a 
commercial zone or residential zone or an environmental protection zone. And then there are different code provisions. So there are actually, there's a heritage code in the state planning provisions. I'll show you that in a minute. They apply to every bit of land in Tasmania. Every council will be subject to those state planning provisions. And then councils will have their own local provisions. And this is where, for example, you might have an individual register of buildings or places that need to be protected. There might be specific provisions um, that apply here in Hobart that don't necessarily apply in another municipality. But, but the Tasmanian plan is then isn't just the top bit, it actually is a local provision shooting as well. The state planning provisions came in effect four years ago now, 2nd of March 2017, but they have no practical effect until a local provision schedule is in effect in the municipal area. So in Hobart, we're still working with the Hobart Interim Planning Scheme 2015 because the Hobart local provisions, which have been endorsed by the council, uh, with the Planning Commission at the moment, but they have not been um, in, endorsed by the Planning Commission. And so, um, Hobart doesn't deal with the state planning provisions yet. The planning provisions will have a consistent set of planning rules for the transfer of zones and 16 codes, which all have to be applied by the different local councils. So, so in the, the statewide provisions, you've got this thing called Local Historic Heritage Code, Code C6. So this is similar to what the schedule in the Hobart Interim Planning Scheme. So it sets out a purpose, where does the code apply, the application, the definition, the exemptions, new standards, there are no new standards, standards for local heritage places, standards for local heritage precincts, etc., etc., significant trees. So, and the subdivision. So it's very similar to what's in the interim planning scheme. So we have local heritage places and local heritage precincts. In our local provision schedule, which hasn't been approved yet, but it's going through the process, you'll, you'll have a, a big long table of all the all the places in Hobart which are subject to these provisions. So this is just the beginning. Um, it gives you the address, the property name, Property details in this week. This is the, the typical um, car. So, this is the section of B. So, you've got Bedford Street, Bell Street, Belton Street, Penn Street. So, it will have that. You've got the title reference. So, when people say, Oh, what's, what's actually listed? Is it just the house? Is it just the facade? Is it just the, you know, what part, what part of our property is listed? Can we build a unit in the back? Can we build um, a garage? Is that part of the heritage listing? The fact that it actually refers to the lot. We can actually put a, a board around what is actually listed. And on the council's GIS, it actually identifies um, the listing by, by reference to the um, form lot. There's also a description as well. There. And that, in fact, that can, um, that can be confusing because you know, someone lives in property in Bedford Street and it says, oh, residents. So, oh, does that mean just the residents are listed? What about the garden? No, everything's listed. Then we've got the precincts. So this is what I said, we've got about 40 or so precincts now. And um, they've all got these fancy reference numbers. HOB-C6.2.1.1, back your point. The name of the precinct, back your point. And what is the description? The code requires the council to assess um, applications against design criteria identified in the um, code. And so what's important about that your point? It is as identified in the um, description serving local for significance and design criteria January 29. So for each of the precincts there's actually a detailed four or five page document that actually sets out why that precinct's important. It sets out the things that contribute to the precinct. It sets out a bit of the history of the precinct. It actually even talks about things that don't contribute or things that are intrude in the precinct. So all that information is actually contained. It's an enormous body of work, actually. The, for each of the 40 or so precincts, there's a, there's a document that actually 
it says why the precinct's important. So this is an example. This is um, 11.3. This precinct's the Lansdowne Crescent and Hill Street precinct in West Hobart. It tells you which streets are included in the precinct. So Allison Street, Ben Street, Bollington Road, etc, etc. Lansdowne Crescent, of course. And then it gives you a bit of background, historical background. How did that area evolve? When was it first subdivided? When were some of the key streets constructed? And therefore, you know, for example, um, you know, why, say, down in Santa Bay, why are all the houses in York Street and Duke Street and so on all built around 1915 to 1925? Well, that's when it was subdivided. It was an old, you know, there was a golf course there before then. And so it was subdivided. And so, you know, you go down to Santa Bay and you, you look at all these houses and there's a, a very high degree of homogenity. So it's important in, in identifying why precinct's important, it's, it's important to understand how it evolved, how it got to where it is now. You can't, you can't describe a precinct just by going around looking at all the houses and saying, oh, that's a you know, Victorian house, that's a Victorian house. How did, why have you got such a concentration of particular buildings in a particular area? Why have you got a couple of big old homes out in Newtown? Well, it's because you, know, you had these big old properties in Newtown that were subsequently subdivided. And then for each of the precincts, it goes through, the, it describes the character and features, so it's the streetscape and townscape, such as the design and topography, vegetation, views of vistas, and dealing with built form, it talks about materials. Here it says a primary mix of timber weather balls and plastic work. Um, what are the particular architectural styles? Orientation building stock fencing. So it goes into quite a lot of detail, and, and this is done for each of the precincts in Highway. And just to make it easy for everyone, it's actually got a little guide here. What are the things that contribute to this precinct? We've got things like, oh, you know, prominent brick chimneys, space brickwork, we've got sympathetic little fences at the front, dormer windows, gardens, etc., etc. A pattern of, of buildings, um, all similar sort of age and architectural character. Street trees, um, prominent views and vistas over the city. Large houses, but also some small modest cottages. So these are the things that contribute to that precinct. And then there are things that are non-contributory, things that actually detract, things that aren't important in the precinct. And if they weren't there, it would probably be good. So large areas of sort of paving in front of the building, large driveways, <coughs> high fences that now come up here so people can actually, gardens that have disappeared and been replaced by grey concrete. And in this particular precinct you've got a number of intrusions where someone in the 70s or 80s has decided to build a, a block of flat. And then because maps are important, there's actually a map showing the actual precinct. You can't see it very clearly here, but it differentiates between um, what buildings are contributory, what are neutral and what are non contributory. And there's a, basically a statement of significance, contributes local history, what are the aesthetic characteristics, what type of buildings are there, what are housing important to the community. And then there are specific criteria. Um, so new buildings, extensions or structures must be compatible with and sympathetic to the single storey scale, bulk setback materials, etc. So the fences and gates should be appropriate in the form of the scale. And that, that is for each of the precincts. Now this is a completely different precinct, obviously, it is on the street. Not many houses there, mainly commercial buildings, pubs, etc. But it, again, it goes through what are the important things in the river street. I mean, you can see it there, can't you? It's good with brickwork. And so this is a map. I love this map because it shows all the different precincts in Hobo, all the heritage precincts. And that shouldn't come as a surprise because Hobart, in terms of European cultural heritage, is the second oldest capital city in Australia. We started in 1804 here. We've got buildings from you know, the 1820s and even earlier. And we've had periods of boom. We've got a very rich stock of Victorian Federation buildings right up, you know, up to the mid-century. 
And there hasn't been the development pressure that is you know, that we've had in a lot of other places. So it doesn't come as any surprise why large areas of Sandy Bay or Newtown or West Hobart are going to be existed because when you actually wander around those streets, you can look at Glee, for example. Um, it's no surprise that those places are listed in, as precincts because they're all intact. That's what we love Hobart, isn't it? And it goes back to all those, doc all those um, comments in the strategic plan about people valuing Hobart. The council adjusted some of the precincts to, we, you know, from the precincts we originally identified. We actually went around street by street and made some minor adjustments to things that didn't actually fit. So I won't go into any more detail about the scheme generally. The important thing, or one of the important things about the local provisions schedule is that all the places on the Tasmanian Heritage Register will not be assessed by a local council benefit anymore. So if someone puts in an application for something that's on the Tasmanian Heritage Register, it will be dealt with only by the Tasmanian Heritage Council. If a place is on the Tasmanian Heritage Register, it will not appear on the local register anymore and it will not be subject to consideration as far as heritage goes by a local council. The heritage consideration will only be undertaken by Heritage Tasmania and the Tasmanian Heritage Council. So the the heritage officers of the council will not be commenting, will not be looking at, uh, and the elected members will not be considering the heritage implications of a place if it's on the Tasmanian Heritage Register. The precincts and the special areas will still be there, but places, if for example there's a place in those precincts on the Tasmanian Heritage Register, it will not be subject to those local provisions. All the heritage aspects will all be dealt with by the Heritage Council. Even though you know, the idea is that the Heritage Council does actually act um, in collaboration with local councils, you would think it would be logical to do yeah. that. Um, but they, they don't have to. And then sometimes the Heritage Council, you know, they, they have in the past have looked very simply at the implications of fabric changes and so on. Um, I think it's of it, it, some concern that um, you, know, you have a list of buildings. If you look at a, you know, a street, a building, some are obviously going to be more important for whatever reason than others. Some are going to be less important. But why, for example, a, a buildings that are on the state bridges that aren't considered holistically, I'm not sure. The other worry that I think I should mention is that um, in terms of local buildings, internal work in local buildings will be exempt. And that, in terms of cultural heritage, is a, is a big concern. You might have a little sandstone cottage in Battery Point, for example, and for whatever reason, you want to pull out all the internal walls. You actually don't want the timber floors anymore. You actually want concrete everywhere. Um, that work will be exempt. It won't even need to go to, you won't even need an application to do it, unless it's on the state register. No. And, you know, that, that is of some concern because heritage to me is more than facades, it is more than skin deep. You lose the integrity of buildings and places. And you go, I, I've seen real estate you know, brochures and stuff, and you, or, and you go inside the buildings and you think, oh, what's happened here? Where's the fireplace gone? You know, what, where's the doorway gone? Where's the skirting board gone? Oh, what have they done to the floor? Um, you know, it might look like an old Georgian house from the outside, but once you go inside, you know, all of a sudden we're in 2021. That to me is on heritage. Heritage is, is everything. Heritage <coughs> isn't just what you can see from the front. And unfortunately, the, the, the Planners, the, um, the, the planning commission, or the, the politician, or whatever, they have this view of cultural heritage in terms of planning that it is really only what you can see from the front. That, to me, isn't heritage. And they probably say, well, if it's so important, put it on the state register and get the heritage to look after it. But I think 
you know, when you when you go back to those other provisions that talk about local councils have a responsibility to you know ensure that our you know, collective heritage is prepared, is preserved for future generations. It isn't just what you see on the outside, it is everything. And we will have more questions. Yeah. Thank you very much.